Welcome back. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Ottawa Senators today. <clears throat> so sometimes I do these videos about a team is doing well or doing poorly, and sometimes they turn it around after I do the video. It has no relation on that at all. But the Ottawa Senators are worthy of a discussion because a few years ago, it was seen that, hey, now it's the worst, but it's going to get better. And we're still here. We're still going through this. So 2016-2017, the last time they made the playoffs, 44-28-10, uh, and 10, they were second in the Atlantic. They made a run all the way to the conference final where they lost in seven games against Pittsburgh Penguins. A highly contested series, right? And so going into the 2017-2018 season, there was a lot of optimism. This is a team that had been that close to the Stanley Cup final, and maybe they needed some help down the middle. So since Kyle Turris isn't coming to an agreement on an extension with them, they get Matt Duchesne, right? They get Matt Duchesne. Sure, you, you give up a little bit of futures and in, in deals here and there, but they do what they got to do. So that season just fell away from them. 28, 43, and 11 was their record that year, seventh in the Atlantic. And then 2018, 2019, an absolute disastrous season. And of course, we had the the locker room issues between uh, Carlson and Hoffman. And then, you know, you got to get rid of Hoffman. And then they ended up getting rid of Carlson. And everybody basically goes. So it's basically last one out, turn off the lights. They finished 29, 47, and 6. They're eighth in the Atlantic 2018, 2019. Eugene Melnick was making news, of course, because he starts complaining about losing money. And he made a statement that seemed to kind of suggest that maybe he was thinking about moving the team if things stayed this way. He walked that back very quickly. And to his credit, we haven't heard anything about this team being in danger of moving, although they do not have the new building they need. Melnick in 2019, very optimistic, whether it was real or whether he was just saying what he had to say, because, you know, you're talking to whether it's investors, whether you're talking to season ticket holders, whether you're talking to your players, it's important to sell the idea of the future is going to get better. He said in 2019, the Sens will be all in for a five-year run of unparalleled success where the team will plan to spend close to the salary cap every year from 2021 to 2025. It all sounded good. The reality is this is a team that's going to have a hard time attracting uh, a big name free agent. So as a, for instance, next summer, if Johnny Goudreau ended up leaving Calgary, would he choose Ottawa over, say, I don't know, Florida? Just throwing that out there. Just saying if, if he had equal offers coming in from Ottawa and the Rangers, would he choose Ottawa? Probably not. Now, where the Ottawa Senators have the benefit is uh, they're going to have a lot of cap space next summer to sign guys. But again, it's a matter of being an attractive location for free agents. And I think this season that's gotten off to the 4-15-1 start makes it more difficult to sell. Makes it more difficult to sell them to, uh, to, to prospective players. I think it makes it harder to sell season tickets. So then you're looking at, you know, if you want to fill the building, you're probably going to have to make the tickets even cheaper. You're going to lose more money. Uh, and their current cap space, to, to go back to this quote here, they have $15 million in cap space 15 million plus according to cap friendly so they have not spent to the cap so why not well a i think that the attracting free agent thing is probably becoming a bit of a problem you have matt murray as the probably i think the biggest ufa signing and that's only because they they traded for his rights and then they they extended him and murray of course has been a, a disaster it just didn't work at all right and then the question becomes is that on matt murray or is that on the senators and i think the answer is both. So the statement that he made about an unparalleled success was seen at the time as a statement to Matt Duchesne and Mark Stone, kind of a, okay guys, stay here, buy into the plan, sign a long-term extension, we're going to get better. Because I think it was understood that they needed continuity. And Stone was the big one, and I think they knew it. That two-way forward who could do a little bit of everything, he would have been the captain if he'd stuck around, but he ends up going to Vegas and the rest is history, right? Now, the deals they made with Vegas and then the deal they made with Columbus, not bad trades. Not at all bad trades, right? However, it does leave a void where you want to have those star veteran players to shepherd in the younger players. So if you look at the roster, there's a lot of players who are 25 years of age and younger who are currently playing prominent roles. Batherson's their leading scorer, 15 games, 7 goals, 9 assists, 16 points. When he's in the lineup, he's been very good. Josh Norris, 
20 games, 8 goals, 6 assists, 14 points. Now, where it's different with Norris is Batherson's already signed until 2027 for $4.975 million. Norris is an RFA next summer, makes $925,000. That's the cap hit. He's going to get a raise. You have to think with how he's played this year, a minimum of $5 million a year, maybe $6 million a year. Maybe with the way salaries have gone even higher. Uh, Kachuk is a good example of this too. 17 games since he came back from his holdout. 5 goals, 7 assists, 12 points. His cap hits $8.205 million till 2028. And again, has he performed up to that contract? I don't think he has. But one thing Ottawa's doing with these contracts is speculation. And it's something we saw a lot with the, Ottawa, or with the Arizona Coyotes three or four years ago. Getting all these young guys and giving them money based on what they're going to do. There's some danger in that. There's some inherent danger in that. And they need to think about that when they're offering up contracts. Because you can give guys big money. They'll take it. And then you have that long-term stability. But is that young roster... Is this core good enough to win games later? Uh, Stutzla stood out as going through the sophomore jinx, sophomore slump, however you want to phrase it. Only the one goal so far this year to go with seven assists for eight points in 20 games. He makes 925000 on the cap until 2023. So they don't have to worry about extending Stutzla until next summer would be the earliest they can extend him. And then it's a matter of do you pay him based on that potential as you have with other players or do you pay him based on how he's played? And if he keeps up what he's done so far this season, he would not get a huge raise. My guess is they offer him like a max length contract and probably a huge raise betting on that rebound. Uh, Shabbat, eight assists in 20 games. He plays more minutes than anybody else in the league. You wouldn't know it by watching him either. He doesn't look tired or anything. But he makes $8 million until 2028. That's the cap hit. That is absolutely a fair cap hit. But again, there's that danger, right? And I, as I mentioned, the Arizona Coyotes, uh, we saw some of those contracts aged well, some of them not as much. And so while the Shabbat one is aged well, we'll see if that's the case with all of them. Uh, Mete, 14 games, the five assists for him. He's an RFA next summer. $1.2 million is his cap hit. Uh, Mete, I would think if they want to keep him around, not a problem, not a big deal. Uh, for Menton has had a bit of a setback this year. 17 games, 2 goals, 1 assist, 3 points. Disappointing numbers from him. Uh, his, his cap hit is $747,500. He's an RFA next summer. So there's going to be some work to be done by Pierre Dorian. Or if, if Eugene Melnick decides this season's a disaster and it's on Pierre, then there may be a brand new uh, general manager in Ottawa. Maybe a Pierre Maguire, as a for instance. Uh, Lassie Thompson, 7 games, 3 assists for him. And Thompson has looked good for Ottawa at a time where there haven't been very many players who've looked solid. He has. Uh, his cap hits 863000 until 2024. That's a huge boost for them if they keep him in the top six, right? Uh, Parker Kelly, 11 games, one goal, one assist. Uh, he has a $762,500 cap hit until 2024 as well. Uh, Adam Gaudette picked up on waivers, has a goal in one game, so he's on fantastic start. Uh, $997,000. $500 is his cap hit. He's an RFA next summer. And if he wants to stay in Ottawa, I would think they keep a spot for him. Bernard Docker. Two games for him, the one assist. Bernard Docker is one of those blue chip prospects. Seen as like a future anchor on this blue line. $925,000 cap hit until 2023. So what you have here is you have Bernard Docker and Shabbat are two key parts of the blue line moving forward, right? Uh, Shane Pinto, five games, one assist. He, of course, has had his season shortened. Likely doesn't play again this year. $925,000 cap hit until 2023. And it's too bad because Pinto is the number two center. Could have been could have been big for him. And that could be part of the reason why Ottawa's sporting a 4-15-1 record, right? Pinto a lot was expected of him. Eric Brandstrom might be the most disappointing of the young players on the board. Just the two games for Ottawa. $863,000 cap hit till next summer. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know with Brandstrom because when he came over in the deal for Stone, he was trucked out as here's here's what we got. This is a, this guy's going to be a big deal. And so far it has not panned out. Now whether that's a statement of Ottawa, whether it's a statement on Brandstrom, whatever it is, it just hasn't panned out. And I don't know how much longer they try to get, you know, get it going with Brandstrom before they either move on from him or something happens, right? Whether it's a trade, whether it's something else that goes on. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, Dylan Gambrello was picked up, of course, from San Jose. Nine games for him. 
1.1 million dollar cap hit to next summer. Uh, Sokolov, four games for him, no points. 818,333 dollars is the cap hit until 2023. And Sokolov is seen as a late bloomer, as a guy who could be, you know, pretty decent scorer for them down the road. And then in net, you have Gustafson sporting a 3 6 and 1 record, 899 save percentage, 3.64 goals against, $787,500 cap hit until 2023. All of this is, is okay, right? Like you can see Thompson, going to be a future, you know, top guy. Bernard Docker absolutely could be as well. So with Shabbat, Thompson, Bernard Docker, and then you look over into the on the way side of things, and you've got Jake Sanderson and Tyler Clevin, both blue liners. This could be a really good blue line, but it needs, it needs like it's Shea Weber, right? It needs it's Roman Yossi. It needs a guy who's been around for a while and been through this, and it needs probably some forwards who are of that same kind of ilk, where they're, they're maybe in their late 20s, maybe early 30s, but they're still star players in the NHL. And whether that's superstar level or whatever it is, they need that. It just feels like they, they need that, that rudder to guide them. And I don't know that the kids necessarily have that. I love Nick Paul. I love Connor Brown. These guys are fantastic and especially shorthanded. I, I just don't know that I look at Ottawa's roster right now and I say, there's a lot of potential with these guys and with this. And I, I don't, I, I try to formulate it, and I can't come up with a formula where I say, yeah, things are really good for them. So with all that cap space, I mean, it's possible next summer they bring somebody in. Obviously, some guys are due for raises this year and next year. There's some questions that have to be asked. Do they continue to pay guys based on what they might potentially do? Because I'll go back to the Arizona discussion, because Arizona was kind of doing the same thing, right? Where they were bringing in all these young guys and paying them, but they never did seem to figure out the veteran side of it. And so they, they just basically were spinning their wheels. There was, of course, in 2020, the upset victory over Nashville, but then reality struck against Colorado when they got into round one. So I, I don't, and I don't know if Ottawa's capable of that. I don't know that they have a goaltender right now that can do what Darcy Kemper did for Arizona that year, right? So Robbie Yarventi is on his way. Ridley Gregg's on his way. Ridley Gregg may very well be a top six forward for this team. Uh, Mad Sogard is another goaltending prospect they have that's on his way up. Uh, as I mentioned, Jake Sanderson, Tyler Clevin, and there's Tyler Boucher, who is a surprise first-round pick, and we'll see how far out he is. And that's a question that's, you know, worth asking. How far out is Jake Sanderson? Does he jump in next year, and he looks great, and does that help Ottawa get better? And then if he takes a spot on the roster, who does he take it from? I, I think at some point when the Senators decide they're ready to go for it, what they're going to have to do is take a greater risk. The greater risk would be to take one or two of the young pieces they have and trade it for a veteran from a team that maybe is going into a rebuild and say, all right, here's a couple of young guys. We get that veteran guy back and we feel like we can make a push for the playoffs with that player. So that's, and that to me is when we'll, we'll be able to say, okay, there's some success here. But we're already into that five-year run that Melnick had predicted, and it's it's nowhere near. And this is the, this is always that danger when you're in a, a rebuild, is asking yourself, so are the Senators right now that much farther along than they were three years ago, four years ago? Their record's gotten worse. There are a lot of reasons why their record has gotten worse. Uh, I And I... I didn't even think, well, we should put all the stats on the on the board because it's just as bad, right? Uh, their, their, power, their power play is back to being bad. Last year was good for long stretches. And in the preseason, it looked like they were going to have a good power play, and then it just hasn't worked. A lot of things that were working last season and into the preseason this year just haven't worked. And again, you can probably come back to Stutzla as being part of the problem here because just the one goal in 20 games isn't enough. And he's been frustrated himself with his lack of production. The new building's important. So one of the reasons of discussing this today is because the LeBreton Flats discussions come up again with, hey, if they want to put a building out here, maybe. Ottawa desperately needs that new building. They are they, in, in a revenue-sharing environment, they are now a taker. They're now a team that gets money from the NHL because they don't generate as much revenue as they, as they used to. They're no longer a giver because Canadian teams, it's been talked about for years how Canadian teams generally generate a lot of revenue, they put money in, and then, oh, look, in Arizona and Florida are going to get the money out. Well, Ottawa is one of the ones as well that 
gets the money out of that because they're not generating as much revenue as they used to. They need the new building. And I think part of the reason why we see all of this cap space, and I know people are going to say, well, Melnick's, Melnick's cheap. I don't think that's it. I think the new building can be big. Look at Edmonton. Edmonton, before they got the new building, I, I think we're floundering. That new building, I think, has helped. I think the new building, I think just that that environment. And then, I mean, obviously, Connor McDavid, and there's no Connor McDavid on this board. So if you're going to be like, hey, they should just wait around for, for Bedard, that might make some sense. But there's still a draft lottery. They may still lose that draft lottery. Don't always assume that you're going to get those number one draft picks. Try to draft the best that you can. Detroit being a good, a good example of this. They didn't draft first overall, but they drafted well. And so drafting well has put Detroit in a position where they're competitive. They're pushing for a playoff spot. Ottawa is still right around the bottom of the league. So Detroit is, it looks like they're coming out of their rebuild. Ottawa's still in it. But the public perception is you've got Iserman there. So guys are going to want to play for Iserman. And they're coached well. And, you know, their numbers are just better. And so there's, there's going to be the discussion about whether or not there needs to be a change behind the bench. There's going to be the discussion about whether or not Pierre Dorian has done the right things to, to make this team work. But I, I think it comes down to probably a perception as well of Ottawa being a B franchise. That if you get equal offers from the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Ottawa Senators, you're going to be like, well, I'll go to Toronto. I'll have an opportunity to play in, in the playoffs. And, I mean, for all the jokes people make about the, the first round uh, exits for Toronto, Toronto has not had a problem bringing in guys who will, play, who will play for less money. So, yes, they spend a lot of money on the top four. Next year will be the top five guys. But they haven't really had a problem with filling out their roster with NHL-level talent and the veterans. The, the Jason Spetzes of the world, who used to be an Ottawa Senator, and Spetz is exactly the kind of guy that the Ottawa Senators need right now. He is playing a bottom six role in Toronto. Doesn't complain about it. He still puts up points. He's a leader on and off the ice. And he's, I, I think Spezza right now might be, might be playing some of the best hockey he's ever played. His game has evolved. And I, I don't see that as much with Ottawa. I don't see them attracting those kinds of players. And they have to become that kind of team that can attract those kinds of players. And that's where the questions have to be asked of how do they get there. It, it's great. You know, tearing the team down is fun. I've I've done the franchise modes and the NHL video games too. And you can tear a team down and just watch them be terrible for a couple years. And then they start getting better. And you're like, man, this is great. It's all turned around. In reality, that turnaround, it can be elusive. Buffalo's a good example. Arizona's a good example. And right now, Ottawa, as we're in year five of this rebuild, they still look like they're a ways out. Is this a playoff team next year? I I guess anything is possible. But if if somebody said, hey, you have to bet on it, I would say, I, I'm going to bet no. If I had to, which I don't. But I'm just saying, for the Ottawa Senators, uh, this is, this is a, a rough situation that they're in. And if they do keep spending on... on what players may do so leaning towards the long-term extensions rather than bridge deals bridge deals you save on that cap hit but you may spend more after the bridge deal is done you also may not spend more after that bridge deal is done if the player doesn't take that next step but they're betting on these guys taking the next step my guess is they keep signing contracts like this which it'll be interesting to see if if those those moves work out or what happens. So I guess the question I have is, for Ottawa fans, and I know there's Ottawa fans, there has to be, it just has to be, but for Ottawa fans, uh, how far does this go? Like, right now, obviously, we're looking at a lost season, yet again. So how many years does it take before this turns around? Or is it going to be next year? And what do the Ottawa Senators need to do in order to turn this around and get to that unparalleled success? And spend to the cap. And again, I think I think that new building is important. And even looking back at, at, at videos and news articles from a few years ago, it was very obvious that the key to all of this was they need that new building. So if Ottawa gets that building, they need it. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happen upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.